Hello, everyone. This is John Teixeira from, from JPL. Um, welcome to the JPL Center for Climate Science virtual mini symposium on climate and radiation monitoring. You can see on the slide uh, the schedule for today. The, this particular mini symposium is just the first of a series that will be focused on essential role of long-term satellite records for both climate science and monitoring. And we have a variety of objectives with this series of mini symposium. And in particular, we'd like to sort of raise the visibility of the sort of of these long-term satellite climate records currently in existence. We would like to highlight uh, critical accomplishments in some selected areas. And, and finally, uh, we will sort of review uh, challenges in sustaining a climate monitoring system. So without any further ado, I think we should start with the first presentation. Uh, Norman Loeb from NASA Langley is the series PI, has been the series PI for a while, for a long time. And he's going to give a presentation on uh, the Earth's energy budget. Um, two quick things. One for Norman and the other speakers. About two, three minutes before the end of your 25 minutes, I'll, I'll let you know. For everybody else, please keep your questions for the final discussion. There will be a moderated discussion of half an hour, moderated by Graham from Graham Stevens from JPL. So add your questions or comments on the chat box. We will check them and we will bring you in for the discussion later on, but we would prefer not to interrupt the presentation since we only have about 25 minutes for each presentation. So, Norman, please take it away. Okay, well, thank you uh, for including me and inviting me to give a presentation. I'm excited to, for the next two hours, um, so it should be a lot of fun. So, I'm going to talk about Earth's uh, energy budget. Um, next slide is my outline. Um, I'm going to very briefly talk about why it matters. Um, spend a lot of time on the data stewardship that's required to produce and sustain uh, an Earth radiation budget climate data record or CDR. I probably can't do it justice. I can only really uh, skim the surface of this topic, but I'll give it a shot. And I'll talk about some of our future challenges. Uh, next. So why does it matter? Next. Well, you've all seen uh, this diagram at some point, uh, Climate 101. It's the, one of the first figures you're shown in uh, a climate class. And what it's really showing is uh, how the energy flows through the climate system. It's an annual average uh, energy budget picture. Um, the blue boxes are actually data products uh, from uh, series, um, except for the incoming solar radiation, which you'll hear a lot more about in the next uh, talk from, from Greg Kopp. Um, so the why does this matter? Well, this essentially is our um, what fuels the climate system. The energy from the sun that's absorbed minus the outgoing long-wave radiation, um, if that's in, in balance, then the planet's in equilibrium and the temperature should remain constant. But we know we're adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, so it's not. And you can think of the net flux as the um, net forcing that the Earth hasn't responded to. So we're perturbing the system that's causing a change to the top of atmosphere radiation. The atmosphere and surface are responding and the delta between those two is equivalent to this imbalance. Uh, within the atmosphere, we know that greenhouse gases are pretty critical. Uh, the Earth would be 33 degrees colder if we didn't have greenhouse gases, and particularly uh, water vapors, one of the most effective, the most effective greenhouse gas. And at the surface, um, the net radiation at the surface is really fundamental because it sets an upper limit on how much global mean precipitation you can have. So understanding all of these different quantities and how they're changing with time as the system is being forced is really important uh, to understand climate as well as uh, test the models which we rely on to predict climate. Next. So here's the relationship between the planetary energy budget and surface temperature that we're so obsessed with. Uh, so if you have an imbalance, the net radiation is zero. So you're adding energy to the system. Um, 
most of that energy ends up as heat storage in the ocean, 90%. Only a small fraction actually is used to warm the atmosphere. Um, part of it's melting the land, uh, um, warming the land and melting snow and ice. So if you have this situation, uh, temperature will increase when you average over a long period of time. But next, I'm not sure if, ah, there you go. So the problem is it's more, much more complicated than this simple diagram because there's also internal variability in, in the system, um, especially at the decadal level. So natural fluctuations and things like ocean currents and atmospheric wind patterns can temporarily cause the surface temperature to vary in a way that it can offset or augment the increase that's associated with global warming. And that's essentially what happened at the beginning of this century. We had uh, what was known as the global warming hiatus, which was simply just internal variability in uh, ocean vertical heat transport. Uh, we had La Niña's over the first part of the 2000s, and then eventually we flipped sign in terms of PDO, and things warmed up very rapidly. So all of this internal variability makes it very difficult um, to really unscramble what's going on, the, the anthropogenic versus the, the, the natural. And the models need to get all of that right. So it's a, it's a, it's a really tough problem. And the observations are critical to make sure that uh, we understand it and, again, that the models are providing the right variability. Next. So why do we care about Earth energy imbalance? Uh, well, it has huge societal implications. I mentioned increases in global mean surface temperature. There's also increases in atmospheric moisture and sea level. Uh, shifts in atmospheric circulation patterns, which leads to extreme weather, flooding, and drought. Increases in ocean heat content, uh, ocean acidification, uh, which impacts fish and other marine biodiversity, as well as decreases in land and sea ice, snow cover, and, and glaciers. So the list is just so long, and this property is such a fundamental property of our climate. Um, next slide. So last year, we uh, looked at this quantity, what we're calling net radiation at the top of atmosphere. And since most of this excess energy entering the system ends up as, as heat storage in the ocean, we got together with um, some oceanographers from NOAA who analyzed uh, in situ data from primarily from Argo autonomous floats that cover the world oceans. And we wanted to see if we tracked one another on an annual basis. And so the plot here shows uh, in red what we got from Ceres in terms of net radiation. And the blue is from um, the in situ data. And the points are annual averages six months apart. And so we're getting a reasonable agreement <clears throat> in the year to year variation. But what really struck us was the trend. Um, we're seeing a trend in series, this is from 2005 onwards because that's really when the Argo sampling was sufficient. But going back to 2000, it doesn't really change the story. What we're seeing is uh, a trend of half a watt per square meter per decade, which is really huge. So over 20 years, that's of order one watt. The imbalance is on the order of 0.76 watts. So that was really quite an alarming result. And it suggests that the uh, Earth energy imbalance has doubled from this 14 year period in both what we're getting from series as well as the in situ data. So this is a pretty scary result to, in, in my view in terms of uh, decadal changes. Next slide. So how do we get there? Um, well, there's a lot of work under the hood that goes into producing these types of records from satellites. So uh, next slide. So let's first, since this is the first talk, let's just define what we mean by climate data record. This is the definition from the US National Research Council. It's a time series of measurements of sufficient length, consistency, and continuity to determine climate variability and change. Next. So continuity of an Earth measurement 
really exists when the quality of the measurement for what, what is a quantified earth science objective, for example, if you want decade to decade change, you want to be able to capture that at the 0.1 watt meter level, that would be an objective. Well, you need the quality in your observing system to be maintained over that required um, period uh, at that time scale and spatial scale. Next. Quality is really characterized by the combined standard and uncertainty. It includes not just the instrument calibration uncertainty, which is the first thing we think about, but it also includes um, the stability, the repeatability, um, the time and space sampling, the data systems for delivery, as well as the algorithms, the reprocessing and availability. All of these enter into what we need uh, for quality and repeatability and stability of these records. Next. So consistency does require then that the instruments introduced to continue an existing CDR produce backward compatible measurements. We can't change the ruler midstream. What we're after is changes in the earth. And uh, while it's tempting to do all kinds of new things technologically, uh, sometimes it um, doesn't help our understanding of the long-term records. So you need to do this kind of, to me, is a prerequisite of being able to understand the climate system. Next. Since there's no truth available, how do you tell that your CDR uh, is right? Um, so the way we do it is we use multiple independent into comparisons uh, that involve both satellite and in situ measurements. and. Um, look at it from multiple ways to make sure that we're getting uh, consistent results throughout and we understand it. Next. So series, the goal is to produce a long-term integrated global climate data record. Uh, I mentioned top of atmosphere, but we also want to look at the surface within the atmosphere and provide uh, consistent uh, cloud, aerosol, and surface properties so you can look at the system as a whole. Uh, we want to look at the variability, understand variability in radiation budget, and um, help the modeling community uh, by helping them test their models, make sure that they're getting the right answer for the right reasons. Next. So we have seven series instruments that have flown on five satellites. Uh, the spatial resolution depends on the altitude of the satellite, ranging from 10 to 24. Uh, it measures radiances that are broadband. Um, so we have a short wave, a total channel, and a window. Um, but the final copy, FM6, replaced the window with a long wave channel. Uh, it's capable of scanning in different ways. You can do uh, cr a cross track or fixed azimuth, which gives you global coverage daily. You could also rotate an azimuth as it scans in elevation, which enables you to provide angular sampling from which we can develop um, empirical angular distribution models to convert the measured radiances to radiative fluxes. And we could also program these um, upload commands so that we can orient scan plane with other satellite instruments to do intercalibrations so that they view the same area from the same viewing geometry. And uh, we also fly with uh, imagers, uh, VERS, MODIS, VIRS, that enable us to provide context within the coarser series footprint in terms of the cloud, aerosol, surface properties. And we have about a factor of two to three improvement in accuracy over what we had with Irby, the predecessor to series. Next. So what we're doing is really an exercise in data fusion. We're not just looking at series. I mentioned already we're, we're bringing in an imager, but we're also bringing in other information. What we want to do is provide a complete spatial coverage of Earth and resolve its diurnal cycle hour to hour. Um, and so we're bringing in other assets like geostationary imagers. So we've so far we've looked at over 20 geostationary imagers. Um, we also bring in solar irradiance measurements from, from Greg Kopp. Um, and we bring in um, meteorological and aerosol assimilation data, primarily for getting the surface fluxes as well as snow and ice maps. 
And these data, these different data sets have varying quality. So we need to try and uh, bring them up to climate scale by, for example, for the geo imagers, we uh, intercalibrate those with the uh, modus or veers. Um, we correct for drifts in, in the geostationary platforms. We try our best to correct for differences amongst the geos. And we're still learning. We're, uh, as I'll show later, it's, we still have challenges that um, we're working um, with the geos. Next. So this is a, a sort of an illustration. If you click on it, it's a movie. It's supposed to be. Yeah, so this is what the globe looks like. This is net flux, top of atmosphere net flux, hour to hour. Um, really looking at the variability, uh, the blue, purple is nighttime, and then the various colors is daytime. If this were cloud free, then that circle that's going around would be nice and homogeneous, symmetric. But what you're seeing here is the impact of clouds. Uh, they're really very complex. You really appreciate looking at this, that the, the earth is really a fluid and a very complicated fluid. So it's no wonder that models have such a struggle with characterizing uh, clouds. Um, and so this data is meant to really help that effort. Next. Um, so this is what the global mean. Now, if we're not using the geos, we just rely on the series sensors on Terra, Aqua, Sumi, MPP, and NOAA 20. This is everything on one slide going from March 2000 to January 22. These are global all sky anomalies. And um, you're seeing uh, pretty nice agreement amongst these different sensors. They're uh, essentially at the monthly time scale, they agreed to three tenths of a watt per square meter, one sigma, and we're not seeing any drift of, of one relative to the other. Um, so it, it's really, again, it's going back to this intercomparing different instruments on different satellites that are processed completely independently. Uh, when they look this consistent, um, it gives confidence in, in, in the results. Next slide. If I take the two longest records uh, from Terra and Aqua and compare them, I can get a sense of how consistent we are in terms of trends. So the top is showing uh, Terra results. This is looking at the trend as a function of record length. So starting in um, March 2000, you can look at how the trend changes as a function of uh, how long the record is. So you could see how noisy it is initially, uh, but then it settles down and uh, it exceeds the gray area, which is a 95% confidence interval uh, at about um, a decade or so, 12 years in this case. The bottom is showing the Terra Aqua difference. So now we're starting in July, 2002, and uh, we're looking at just the trend difference between the two as a function of record length. And if you look at the whole record, um, What's really amazing to me is that they're holding together, they're consistent to better than a tenth of a watt per square meter uh, for the full period, which is better than we ever expected it, uh, back in 2000. So it's really um, quite nice that we're getting very consistent results between these two satellites. Next. Series EBAF um, has been a real evolutionary process. What we discovered early on is um, users just want one product that's a kind of one size fits all. And I mentioned we had struggles with geos. Geos give you a lot of diurnal information, but because they're really intended for weather and, and they really change over time in terms of their characteristics, uh, they're a real challenge to do to use for, for client data record. And so we really struggled to, to sort of uh, tell users at first, well, if you want to do diurnal cycle, use the SYN one degree product. If you want to look at trends, look at the SSF one degree. And if you want this, use that. No, they didn't. Have, they didn't want any of that. They want just give me one product that does it all. And so, EBAF was our attempt to do that. Um, it's our monthly CDR product, level three, 
uh, meant for multiple scientific purposes, the climate evaluation, variability, and trend analysis. To do that, it had to be as stable as our S-series SSF1 degree that doesn't bring in geo, accurate regionally, which does require diurnal sampling, particularly over marine stratus or uh, deep convection over land. Um, so we had to really work hard to figure out how to use the geos to provide the diurnal information without bringing in the artifacts um, that geos have. And I, I think we were successful with that. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because I don't have time. Uh, it also has to have accurate global mean shortwave long wave net. And so, um, you know, our, our accuracy absolute is about 1%, one sigma in the shortwave, which is already a watt, which is too large uh, for things like Earth's energy imbalance. And so we use the EEI from in situ as a constraint to do uh, a one-time adjustment within uncertainty. But the variability is completely um, from our product. Uh, a long-standing problem with modelers was clear sky. Uh, they do a calculation with clouds, and then they repeat the calculation by removing clouds. Well, we can't remove the clouds in observations. We look at areas between clouds that are clear, and that's our clear product. Well, they're not the same, especially in the long wave. Um, and so modelers were complaining about this bias that were, they were seeing and didn't quite understand why. And so we came up with a way of um, providing them with series derived fluxes that accounted for the differences in definition. Uh, computed surface um, have to be consistent with the top of atmosphere. And so we use constrainment algorithm to make adjustments to the inputs to fool the out with an uncertainty so that we can ensure that that's the case. So a lot of things had to be done and it's an evolutionary process and we're still learning, we're still making changes as we see. Next. So here's an example of the sorts of things we were seeing. In addition, 2.8, uh, we were using the geos uh, very heavily. Uh, in addition, 4, we uh, came up with a technique that used uh, them in more of a normalized way to try and remove impacts from geo artifacts. So the top is what we're seeing from addition 4. The bottom is the difference between addition four and 2.8. And you could see the, the geo areas sticking out. They're pretty obvious there. Um, so that was certainly an improvement, uh, lessons learned uh, the hard way. Um, so you have, sometimes you have to put out stuff that you're not too happy with to find out that it's a problem and then, you know, you fix it in the next version. So reprocessing, reprocessing is a really important part of this too. Next. This is another example of a problem that we have with geos. Uh, addition 4.1 surface net flux on the right, you can see very clearly there between uh, 180 and 240 or so. Uh, this area is just sticking right out of the page, whereas the other areas you're not seeing as much. The left is just if you use the aqua. So you take the modus cloud properties and do a rate of flux calculation and calculate a trend, it looks pretty clean. It doesn't have those weird geo artifacts. And it turns out um, by doing some digging, Seiji Kato found out, next slide, that the problem is actually in the long wave. So this is the surface net long wave flux anomaly. Um, looking at the different geos, you could see how when we went from GOES 11 to 15, uh, there was a jump there and then GOES 17, which is completely different characteristics, uh, had a big drop. Um, so that really messes things up. Um, and they're due to cloud IR emissivity and cloud height discontinuities in, in that downward flux that we just learned about. We didn't know ahead of time what we would get. And so we have to respond to this by coming up with a way that mitigates these types of issue. Uh, next. Another um, surprise we had was the reanalysis that we use as input. So we've been we start, we don't reprocess very often. Uh, we try and minimize the number because it's a huge effort. Uh, and the users don't want you reprocessing too often either. So you end up having uh, older data sets lasting a long time. 
uh, longer than you would like. And this is an example. We've been using the GEOS 541 reanalysis. And when you compare it against MERA 2 and ERA 5, you get all kinds of discontinuities popping up. You start to lose uh, inputs. In this case, the MHS on MEDOP A went, and then all of a sudden we had a discontinuity. So these are things that um, pop up that cause problems that you have to deal with. So two, next two slide. Minutes. Norman, two minutes. Ten minutes? Two, two. About two or three. Okay. All right. The mean local time issue, um, it's another issue. Next slide. And these are plans for um, the future. Uh, I don't have time to go into much detail. Um, we're going to be producing a Terra only, Terra plus Aqua and NOAA 20. And um, we're going to have to deal with each of the problems I mentioned. And this kind of describes where we're going with that. Um, next. All right, I'm going to talk very quickly about the gap analysis. Um, go next. So right now we have trim, well, Terra Aqua, Sumi MPP, NOAA 20, and eventually we're going to have Libra. Um, next. Libra here is run out of LASP. Uh, Peter Paluski is the PI. It's designed to be backward compatible with series with better instrument, better calibration and also will provide a, a split shortwave. Um, next. So I wanted to get to this. This is really kind of the main thing, um, the gap analysis. What we want to know is, given the suite of satellites that are flying and planned, what is our probability of a data gap? Because uh, we really can't tolerate a data gap because of um, you know, absolute accuracy isn't just isn't there. So we did this gap analysis. Uh, next slide. So this is it here. Um, this is a gap risk as a function of time. We assume that Libra launches in 2028, and we have different scenarios for um, uh, Terra 2023, which we're currently funded for, versus 2026, which we can attain. Uh, Sumi MPP. Uh, we're not sure. We hear rumors 2024 is possible end date, uh, but consumables are available through 2027. So let's walk through these in detail. Next. Okay, so let's look at 2025, the gap probability. It exceeds 20%. The worst case scenario is if NPP ends in 24 and Terra and Aqua end in 23, um, it's 20% gap probability. If either MPP or Terra or Anaqua end in 26, that goes down to 5%, big, big change. Next, in 26, well, Terra and Aqua go away no matter what, but MPP could still stay. So if MPP goes away, we got a 20% probability of a gap, but if we keep it up through 27, it goes down to less than 10%. Next. In 28, by the time Libra launches, we're looking at a 38% of a gap, probability of a gap, no matter what. That's problematic. Uh, and then beyond that, we don't have any plans for the future. Next. Um, this is sort of going through a question about how do we bridge a gap. Um, so if you have uh, A, it would be uh, a mission that's flying, then it dies and you have a, say a one year gap and then you fly up another mission. How do you pin those two together? Again, the absolute accuracy isn't good enough to be able to do that across all of the various inputs we have. So we tried this next, we tried to sort of quantify the uncertainty by using uh, computed fluxes. If you had an imager that spans the gap, assuming a one year gap. Now, if you have a longer gap, the, it's, it's a lot trickier because uh, the imager has to remain um, healthy and stable across the gap. Um, so what we found by, since we know the truth, we have Terra and Aqua spanning this gap and we could just poke a hole in it and then use um, the Im imager derived fluxes to, to quantify how well we can um, pin the two together. We're at about a few tenths of a watt per square meter 
um, but which is pretty good when you think about it. We're you know the mean here is uh, on the order of 96 watts, 97 watts in the short wave. It's 240 watts or so in the long wave. But the decade to decade variability is on the order of a tenth of a watt. So it's not really good enough um, to do the kind of paper that we did uh, on Earth's energy imbalance. This would be a huge problem uh, to come up with that conclusion that we found. Um, so this is a real issue. Um, the gap is a real problem. And I'm concerned, given that we have a 40% or so gap probability by the time Libra launches is uh, kind of scary in my mind. Um, next. So uh, series provides a pretty long continuous record. Um, it's been um, used for multiple scientific purposes. I mentioned uh, Earth's energy imbalance, but it's also used for cloud feedback studies, model evaluation, aerosol uh, work. Uh, again, a tremendous effort is needed to, to make sure that you have a seamless CDR. Uh, it never ends. There's always an input that does something weird that you have to respond to and make sure that you're not introducing a discontinuity. And I mentioned the gap uh, being uh, a huge concern. So I think I'll stop there since I'm probably over. <laughs> thank you. Norma, thank you. It's a wonderful presentation. We'll collect, we are, as we mentioned, collecting the, the messages on chat and, and, and Grammy will organize the discussion around it. So we will move to the next presentation. Uh, the next presentation will be on solar irradiance by uh, Greg Kopp, who is at the University of Colorado Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics, LASP. He's been the instrument scientist NPI for uh, four of the NASA total solar irradiance instruments. And right now he's the instrument PI of Clarius Pathfinder hyperspectral instrument for climate science. So, Greg, please take it away. Thank you. Need to unmute Greg or Hall. Okay, I can unmute. Yeah, can you make sure he's unmute. Great. Okay. Okay, there we can hear. You. Now, am I easier to hear? Um. Okay. Yeah. Well, I wanted to thank the organizers for scheduling this on tax day, where we're going to be talking about energy budgets. Uh, I, in particular, am going to be talking about the Earth's incoming energy, the solar irradiance. And here's Norman's 101 climate picture um, of the outgoing shortwave and the outgoing infrared. I'm going to, those kind of encapsulate our three talks today. I'm going to be talking about the total solar irradiance, the net incoming energy to the Earth system. About half of it makes it down to the ground and gets absorbed. A third roughly is reflected and a small amount is absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere. But we need to know what that incoming energy is before we start distributing it among this complex climate system. Most of the energy comes, almost all of it, comes from electromagnetic radiation. The total solar irradiance gives the Earth about 1,361 watts per square meter at one astronomical unit from the sun. Other ways that the sun interacts via energy are energetic particles and solar wind, but those are each down four, seven orders of magnitude from what we have from photons, the electromagnetic spectrum. And for comparison, galactic cosmic rays, they're down another order of magnitude. So really all of the energy that the Earth is getting comes from solar irradiance. We measure that at one astronomical unit or you know, the, the mean distance the Earth is from the sun and find it's 1,361 watts per square meter. That means that the entire sun is putting out four times 10 to 23 kilowatts. That's a big enough number. You can't really fathom what it is. But that means that the sun is putting out enough energy to provide the entire Earth at its current usage rate, the energy that it needs for the next almost million years in one second. Um, so that might make it a little easier to understand what 10 to the 23 means. Um, 
the sun is doing that by converting uh, almost 10 to the 12 kilograms of hydrogen into helium every second. Um, I think that works out to something on the order of a billion SUVs in terms of mass that are being converted every second. Um, the sun is so dense in the center, which is where all of that energy production occurs, that it's taken hydrogen and it's compressed it down to be 150 grams per cubic centimeter, 15 times the density of lead. Um, and still, this is hydrogen, the stuff that would float dirigibles here on the Earth. So it's that dense in the center that when energy is produced, it's that dense and the sun is so big, it takes somewhere between 100,000 and a million years for those photons to scatter their way up to the surface where they're finally emitted. So the photons we're seeing today, the energy from the sun we're seeing today, was created something on the order of a million years ago. So a little bit of fun background on the Earth's energy. Uh, like I said, that energy, or the sun's energy, that energy that's powering the Earth is 99.97% of every bit of energy that the Earth has. Andrew Crenn, a few years ago in his thesis, did this terrific summary of all the different energy sources that heat the Earth. The sun is up at the top here, and I normalize that to one on the right-hand column. Relative to the sun, there are a lot of secondary sources, and many of them come from the sun indirectly, such as infrared radiation from the full moon. The sun heats up the moon, the moon emits, we get some of that energy to heat the earth. Sun also is what's allowed us to create coal and oil, and uh, we burn some of that, and that gives us a little bit of energy. It creates magnetic storms, air glow, and, and so on. There are a lot of secondary sources that come from the sun. And then there are sources that come from other things, the largest of which are heat flux from the Earth's interior, um, radioactive decay inside the Earth. Those secondary sources that are non-solar are 4,000 times lower than what we're getting from the sun. So essentially, you can think of all of the energy that we are seeing is coming from the sun. Now, if the sun varies, and it does, it would have a huge effect on Earth's climate. And it does have an effect on Earth's climate, but it, it's not a big effect. And the reason is the sun is fairly stable with time. So even though it's kind of this 800 pound gorilla sitting in the energy system, it's a very placid gorilla, luckily for us. It does vary a bit and this is a movie that shows some variability. That blue curve is the total solar radiance in watts per square meter measured at 1 AU and how it changes with time as the sun is rotating. Large sunspots such as this one here cause immediate short-term decreases in the sun's output. Those couple that formed and passed across the disk right there caused the largest short-term decrease we've ever measured in the sun's output. That was a 0.3% decrease. So very large, but short. And climate integrates over much longer time periods. So that doesn't have an immediate effect on the Earth's climate. But the sun is variable, as you can see from this video here. I know a lot of people want to call it the solar constant, and it's not. Now, you do hear a lot about other solar activity types. Uh, solar flares or um, CMEs that are released from the sun. Flares are the largest explosive event in the solar system. Uh, the equivalent of 40 billion large atomic bombs going off all at once. Uh, so they're huge explosively and you do hear a lot about them, but compared to the energy output from the sun, they're minuscule. We recorded with the source total, total irradiance monitor the first measurement of a solar flare in total irradiance. What that lets us do is integrate up the net radiation energy that's released by that flare. This is a plot in red of the change in total solar irradiance during the flare with the peak that you can see uh, right here just after 11 o'clock UT. 
So we can integrate up all the energy under there, and it's seven times 10 to the 32 ergs um, of energy. But I want to point out the scale here. This was the fourth largest flare that we've ever recorded. And this is how small it is relative to the background total solar irradiance. Here's another way of looking at it. Uh, the sun is moving around just because of boiling convection and oscillations all the time at a kind of 100 part per million level. On top of that, there's this flare. It was less than 300 parts per million, less than 0.03% of what the sun is putting out in terms of energy all the time. Here's another way of looking at it. That large decrease that I showed you in TSI, this 0.34% decrease, um, the flare occurred somewhere right here around the 28th of October. And you'll see on this scale, you can't see it at all. So that's how insignificant these big events that are explosive, they can have other effects, but in terms of energetics, uh, they really have no effect at all on the output of the sun or the input to the earth. That input to the earth means that our incoming energy balanced with the outgoing energy gives us a sort of mean temperature of roughly 280 degrees Kelvin, taking into account some albedo effects and emissivities. So this pretty much is what's heating up the Earth's climate system to be livable for us. So people trying to model this want to know what is this value? How much energy do we have coming in? They want it to be a nice, simple answer. Uh, they want it to be, well, it's not 42, it's 1,361 watts per square meter. Uh, it's called the solar constant, but it really isn't. I've shown you how it varies with time. Over a few minutes, like we've seen, it varies because of convection and oscillations at the 0.01% level. Over a few days, it's about 0.3%, and that can be from those large sunspots like we showed in the movie. Over an 11-year solar cycle, it's got a pretty sinusoidal pattern that varies about 0.1%. On evolutionary time scales, it varies by a tenth of a part per billion per year. So very stable in those times. What we really want to know about, though, are how does it vary on these intermediate century level time scales? Because those are such that they can really affect climate. The 11 year solar cycle does have a signature in climate, uh, but long term variations over many decades or centuries, because this is all of the energy driving the Earth system could have a much bigger effect on climate. Those, unfortunately, the things we most want to know about are the hardest ones to measure and the ones we know the least about, somewhere between 0 0.05 and 0.3% over centuries. There are orbital effects, these Milankovitch cycles, changes in the Earth's orbit that can change the direct radiative forcing that we have. Uh, those are on kind of 20,000 to 400,000 year time scales. So things that do have an effect on climate, but not immediate ones for us. Much more indicative are long-term changes in the sun's activity that we have records of from sunspots. And starting in the 1600s, early 1600s, we collected a good record of sunspots that give us an idea of how the sun has been changing with time. And it was William Herschel in 1801 that created the first publication correlating anything that, with climate to the sun. And in his case, it was the price of wheat in London varied with the number of sunspots on the sun. So that was the first publication linking sun to climate. Jack Getty in 1976 had a much more prominent paper where he linked Maunder Minimum, a time when there were very few sunspots on the sun for 70 years, to the Little Ice Age in Europe. 
he showed this correlation between launder minimum, again, this time of very little solar activity as indicated by sunspots, and cooler temperatures in especially Europe. And extrapolated that a little bit further to come up with records of winter severity in blue and solar activity in orange showing correlations between the two. And that really got the sun climate connection going nicely. We now have much better records and longer records. Here's a plot showing temperatures for the last hundred years at the top of the screen and components that have caused or let us model up what those temperatures are due to El Nino in purple, volcanoes in blue, total solar irradiance in green, and anthropogenic forcing in red. Fits like this let us attribute causes of climate change to these different components, some natural, some human caused. And the natural components account for somewhere around 10% or less even of warming over the last hundred years. But still, they are things that we do want to know, want to be able to track and attribute as causes of climate change. And total solar irradiance is one of those um, variables that we need to be able to measure and monitor for long periods of time. With the sunspot record, we can come up with models for how the total solar irradiance has changed with time. And I show some of those models in the upper right. We wanna be able to measure those long-term changes in the sun's output. What does that really mean? Well, for one, that the answer is, it means we've got a difficult problem ahead of us. Climate quality measurements are extremely difficult to be able to do. Those are changes that have blown up a bit uh, in the plot in the left. Over an 80 year period coming out of Mondra Minimum, if we were to see that today, we would like to be able to measure that long term trend in the sun's output, that gradual increase in brightening that we think it had. How big is that? That's something on the order of 0.1% variability over 80 years. That time period is very hard to get good stable measurements and continuous measurements for. Here's how you might be able to, or here's what it would mean. You need to be able to measure 0.1% over 80 years. That's a sort of monitor minimum variation. You need to be able to do that on top of this gray curve that shows the 11 year solar cycle. So that's kind of the natural background variability that and underneath which you have to discern a long-term trend of 0.001% per year, roughly, or better. The, the better here is five parts per million per year that you need to be able to measure a trend in. You need an instrument that's got to be more stable than that, and it's got to last for 80 or 100 years. That's hard to do, uh, like Norman was showing. There are lots of different spacecraft you have to swap through to get things to last decades, let alone a century. So you'd need overlap. You'd need to stitch together records from a dozen or more instruments to come up with a good stable record for that period of time. Over those longer time periods, you start to rely on absolute accuracy. If you can take a measurement today with sufficient accuracy, that can help you withstand a gap in measurements because you'd be able to come back 100 years in the future with another instrument that had good enough absolute accuracy to discern changes. So you need stability on short time scales and you need accuracy on long time scales. If you can get your absolute accuracy down to about 100 parts per million, you can detect long term trends even if you don't have continuity and instrument stability. So we try for both. We want good absolute accuracy and we want very good stability. And those are what drive the performance requirements for measuring total solar irradiance. Absolute accuracy of about 0.01% or 100 parts per million. And stabilities of 10 times better than that. That lets you distinguish between offsets in different measurements and the absolute accuracy lets you 
detect long-term trends, even if you don't have data continuity. Stability helps you as long as you have data continuity and be able to put together overlapping measurements from different instruments. How do you make these measurements? Fundamentally, you're measuring power and area. Early on, this was done with a black absorptive surface that contained a flask of water underneath it. You measured the temperature of the water. Sunlight would heat the black surface, heat up the water. You knew the area of that surface. You knew the temperature change in the water. That gave you the power in the area, watts per square meter, although at the time it was kilocals per square meter per minute. Uh, but still, that fundamentally, we're doing the same thing, just with fancier instruments now that fly in space. We have a precision aperture that determines the area from the sunlight. We have an absorptive radiometer that measures the power of the entering radiant sunlight. And that, again, gives us watts per square meter. It's a trivial concept. It's a difficult thing to measure accurately. I said we wanted to do 100 parts per million absolute accuracy. If we mismeasured the radius of that aperture by a third the wavelength of light, we've shot our entire error budget right there. We do these measurements from spacecraft because you can't get all of the sun's energy down on the Earth's surface. It's absorbed or scattered by the atmosphere. So now you're up in space and you're whipping around the sun or the Earth. The Doppler shift alone is a 50 part per million correction that you have to make. Luckily, it's one you know very well, but it's the kind of thing you have to keep track of extremely accurately and correct for in data processing to be able to get anywhere near this level of needed accuracy. So these are non-trivial measurements to get. The radiometers now, instead of being flasks of water, they're black absorptive cavities that are electrical substitution radiometers. Multiple of them let you track for degradation in your primary one. Uh, the total irradiance monitor flies four such cavities that measure the sun and provide very accurate measurements of the total solar irradiance with time. We've flown four of these so far. And here's what the current data record now looks like. We do have good agreement between contemporary instruments. This did take a little while to get to, but we are there. Um, this lower value of 1,361 watts per square meter, it, it initially, like I said, took a while to get there. When we launched the first of these instruments, which was more accurate than preceding ones, it measured about 0.3% lower than all of the preceding instruments, but did get the community to kind of come together and figure out the causes of these offsets and the discrepancies between the instruments. So we now have much better agreement, um, although it, like I said, did take a little while about 10 years to get there between our first publication of this lower value of 1,361 watts per square meter and a now accepted by the IAU uh, adoption of that value. So we do have much better agreement in these measurements now. Right. Uh, this is Joan. Uh, two minutes. Thanks. Thank you. Um, but still do rely on continuity and stability. Um, we, you know, perhaps with the improved accuracy could withstand a gap uh, better than we could before, but being able to have stable instruments that are measuring continuously uh, is still what we rely on to be able to put together all of those measurements into one record. And like Norman has done with series, we want to have one product as well, kind of a one go-to product, and that's a composite. Someone else has put together all of those different instruments in the upper right into a single composite uh, that the climate community and the modeling community can use. So we've now done that as well. Now, you, Norm talked a bit about data gaps at any one time, at kind of an instantaneous failure probability for a spacecraft, there's a high probability, relatively high at launch, 
and then perhaps lower once you get to orbit. A new instrument's going to work for a while. The orange curve on here is kind of the instantaneous probability of failure with time. As things age, sooner or later, it's going to fail. Cumulative probability of failure is shown in red for that single instrument. Uh, or conversely, in blue, probability of operation is decreasing with time. But you need to have overlapping instruments. How frequently do they need to overlap? The more frequently you launch things, the lower numbers on here, the lower your probability of failure over many years. And this goes for 100 years. 10-year launches mean you've got a pretty quickly increasing probability of failure that you're not going to have continuity. Um, but th th this is an example I put together for some specific instruments uh, back, oh, 10 years or so ago. But the concept is still the same today. Anything that you launch is going to gradually increase uh, or, or decrease the probability that it will be there until you launch the next one and then you get measurements again. But the overall probability of continuity is monotonically decreasing as shown in red for any series of instruments in space that you're relying on continuity from. This is a plot of what we do have flying now, uh, now being sort of the end of the gray curves up here. Uh, but we do have a good promising future with several upcoming instruments. We do have the TSIS-1 that's currently flying. Um, and SOHO Virgo that launched in 1995 is still going and producing data now. So several instruments that are going and more that are coming up. So good promise here. Now I do need to say that there's a lot more, and Eric's going to talk about this a little later, that you want to know than just the total amount of incoming energy. You want to know its spectral distribution because that spectral distribution and how it varies affects where energy is absorbed in the Earth's atmosphere and how it's changing the Earth's atmosphere and how it's changing indirectly or directly climate. So there's a lot more to it than our one number, which isn't one number, it's a time series anyway. Uh, Total solar irradiance, are, these are the most accurate and most stable solar irradiance measurements that we have for the Earth's energy balance measurements. Uh, they give us the net energy input with very low uncertainties. They have stabilities that are right on the edge of being able to detect climate relevant solar variability. And we have a 43 year record of solar irradiance from space of that total energy input to the Earth's climate system. You also want to know the spectral solar irradiance because that tells you where that energy is deposited in the climate system, how that can affect global circulations and how relevant it is for climate models. So we need both of these. Uh, but in summary, the total solar irradiance gives us almost all of the Earth's incoming energy. Uh, that value is 1,361 plus or minus 0.5 watts per square meter accepted by the IAU. And in the units that Norm showed or the uh, Climate 101 plot shows, it, it's a fourth of that. Uh, so in today's talk units, that's 340.2 watts per square meter. Um, there is a climate consensus TSI composite that gives you your kind of one go-to time series uh, for what the solar irradiance is. The spectral solar irradiance determines where that energy is absorbed and that affects climate and it also affects the outgoing radiation distribution that we have. And the last thing I wanna say again is the solar constant is not a constant. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Greg, great presentation. Um, we will now move to the Last main speaker, the third speaker, uh, it's uh, Larry Stroh from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Larry has played probably the most important role in setting up all of the US hyperspectral infrared instruments. He's been involved in all of them. And he is going to talk to us about hyperspectral infrared radiation. Can I share the screen, Joel? Okay. Sure, please go ahead. I requested it. 
Oh, wait a minute. Okay. Can you see it? Yes. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, as Joe said, uh, titles hyperspectral infrared radiation. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Graham and Joao for inviting me to give this talk, and I'd like to acknowledge Sergio Decision Machado, who uh, does a lot of this work. Uh, we work very closely together. <clears throat> um, okay. Um, you know, this is a, a, a compared to the last two talks. Uh, hyperspectral infrared data doesn't have as long a history by any means, and it does not also have a, a concentration on getting data sets to the CDR level, and uh, uh, including both radiances and products. So this one, uh, we're, we're talking a lot here about how good are these instruments? Are they? Can they supply these these type of measurements? And, and what are the right ways to do it? Um, so we got to prove that we have stability. In my opinion, we have to focus on simple retrieval approaches. These are incredibly complex data sets with 2,000 to 8,000 spectral channels. Um, um, and because they are all pseudo or operational for weather and out for weather forecasting, uh, there's a lot of them up there. So what we're hoping to do here is to just show that these data out of the box right now, without really much attention to climate, are can can provide important measurements and and especially interested in in minimizing a priori information in this. Now in the future, of course, we want to uh, these infrared can't do everything, and just as with with series. Um, we we really need to combine these data, and that kind of work hasn't really started. But um, working with um, um, Stephen Leroy, uh, who's who is uh, going to be helping with, we're going to try to include GPSRO. We've looked at MLS, and of course uh, the imagers are very important, but they haven't really been used yet. Um, just some disclaimers here. There's a lot of different sort of things you can do with these sensors, so there's a lot of things I'm not going to talk about. Um, the good news is we've got lots of sensors. They overlap a lot, and they should be around uh, Chris, especially and Yazzie, till the 2040 time frame. Uh, Airs is still operating. We hope it operates for a couple more years. So, and we've got enough observations now. We can think about how to do climate and test it. Um, Chris started in 2012. Uh, with SNPP, there's four JPSS follow-ons. Um, we will be doing thermal vac testing of the fourth JPSS uh, in the coming year. So it's real and exists. Uh, Yazi, pretty much the same thing, started in 2007. Uh, there were three on the MetOp A series. Uh, the first one has, has ceased to operate. The other two are doing fine. And then there'll be three on the MetUp SG series, uh, slightly higher spectral resolution. Um, e, the UMETSAT has now produced an IASI-1 CDR. I've downloaded it. It's for the first 10 years, but I haven't analyzed it yet. Uh, finally, what is to me really uh, important for climate work with hyperspectral sensors is that we put together a radiance product called CHIRP. It exists at the JESDA stack, and in fact, it got transferred to the AWS cloud this uh, last couple months. And what it does is it converts the AIRS spectral response to a version of the CRIS spectral response, and it removes inter-satellite offsets. And because I am proposing that you try to do as much of your climate analysis in radiant space and convert to geophysical properties as late as possible, that's really important. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that later. So just, just as an illustration for people that aren't used to seeing this, here's some example of what these spectra look like. Um, many millions are taken per day. Um, uh, at the top is Ayers, then Iazi, uh, Chris with uh, Hamming appetization, uh, which is the way it operated until about 2000, end of 2014. And then uh, um, 
yellow is uh, once it was turned into a high resolution mode. Chirp will be in between the same as Chris and the long wave band in between the Chris high res and low res for the other band. So this is the basic measurement. And as you see, it spans basically uh, 15 microns to four microns. So what I'm going to do here is, is because you know these programs are possibly coming to an end within NASA in the not too distant future, I think it's really important to one make the case they can do climate and they're going to produce valuable information you can't get any other way, but we better figure out how to do it relatively inexpensively as well, or it's not going to happen. Um, so this is driven partly by the fact that it's pretty clear that you know. Level two plus time is not climate. I, I, I think Norm has made that point quite nicely. Um, how much reprocessing it takes to do things and other instruments need to be added. Um, I, I was a, a chair of a white paper we put together for NPP for, for NASA headquarters. And it became very clear when we did that, that they believe level two plus time did equal climate. At least some people did. I don't think that's that's as... Uh, common viewpoint these days. Um, second is possibly full sampling of a data set is not required for climate. These sensors are, are very high sampling for 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 an NWP uh, process. So I already said we want to manipulate the data in radiant space as long as possible because we want to keep a priori information out of the system as long as possible. And if we, I'm proposing that we do uh, the work I'm going to show at least is we work with radiance anomalies. So we remove the the constant and the um, uh, seasonal effects, and that reduces. So when we when we do retrievals from that, that re reduces greatly the sensitivity to calibration RTA bias. I'm not going to talk about offsetting these sensors, but we do it two different radiometric offsets. We do it two different ways. They agree to about 0.02 to 0.03 K, which is good enough for climate. Uh, we need overlap for one of those, but we can use a third party instrument to bring together two sensors that, that are not overlapping in time. If that third party sensor, i.e. AASI, uh, is, it exists during the, the gap time. But my guess is we'll have overlap since these are operational sensors. Um, we do optimal, optimal estimation retrievals and we try to regularize much more by smoothing than the a priori. This is a, it's a difficult thing to, to invert these, and that's why NWP does it within the context of data assimilation of the radiances. And finally, I really think we need to get more people involved with this. We want people to use radiances rather than, than, than level two products that are very complicated, take a long, 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 long time to develop, and you, you can't just retest a level two algorithm and say, what happens if I change this? Well, you're going to have to wait a year, maybe, and then maybe another couple of years to do the development. So we're getting this stuff into the cloud for more people to use. So how stable are these sensors? I'm going to concentrate on air since it's been up for 20 years. And this plot shows uh, a retrieval we did from clear ocean uh, scenes of, of airs lasting over 16 years in this particular case. And um, uh, what we did is we retrieved the temperature profiles, humidity profile, CO2 trends, methane, so on and so forth, and then compared our retrieval to the ESRL CO2 global uh, uh, measurement, which you could argue is an SI traceable thing. And so right, what you see here is the data in plus, blue plus signs, and then the um, ESRL uh, global measurement of this trend. You can then you then turn that into equivalent temperature, uh, uh, brightness temperatures, and we come up with stabilities on the order of O2 K per decade. If we use SST, we get a minus 0.02 per decade. So we're 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 pretty pretty uh, in good range for doing for doing uh, climate. Uh, I will mention you know Greg talked about the 2003 sunspot and it did have an effect on the climate record it made it, it gave us instrument burps 
uh, which we're still struggling with a little bit. Um, I have similar plots for, met for methane, uh, which is relatively uniform at the scale we're looking at, and, uh, growth increase, and nitrous oxide, which is quite uniform. And out of AIRS 2378 channels, we have found about 400 that meet our criteria as very, very uh, uh, stable. The short wave is not stable. So what we're going to do here is just give some examples of what can be done. Um, I'm concentrating on clear and I'm concentrating on what can be done quickly and easily to make make a, a case. So what we've done is we've taken the airs data set, the whole 150 terabytes or so, and we've regridded it onto six into files of 16 days on a three by five lat long sample. And then we do trends on each one of those individually. What we're doing is we sample right now about the 3% of the hottest scenes. So there's a lot of liens associated with that, but we will be testing them, but it's pretty amazing to me how well that works. Um, we can sample cloudier scenes and do retrievals on uh, subsets of these, uh, of these data. But I'd like to point out here, we really need what, what Mo, Mo, uh, series uses for MODIS. We really need footprint match cloud parameters from MODIS. Uh, University of Wisconsin has done this for years, and that would help us subset scenes better and classify scenes before we do retrievals. So for the next few slides, or actually most of the rest of the talk, I wanna make a big point, and that is, it takes about an hour maximum to do this 16 year trends. I'm gonna talk about trends, not anomalies, because the trends are easier to do. Uh, we can do them directly. Uh, so this is turnaround times that are orders and orders and orders of magnitude faster than you could do with a standard level one. If we wanna resample, say we want, don't wanna get the 3%, it takes about two days. So you put this on the cloud and it's all minutes. So what is, a, what is the long-term uh, 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 drift uh, not drift, but trends in airs look like, and this is all over, night, most, mostly you'll be seeing over 19 years. So just for ease of being able to show something, I'll just do global. So on the left, you see the trend in the brightness temperature over uh, 19 years and, and K per year. And I've overlaid all sky in red over top of the hottest 3%. So you see something uh, now, of course, this is global. It's not gonna happen on a regional basis uh, as clouds move around. But as you can see, it's, it's quite an overlay. Uh, here you see some differences. And that's why we do not use the air shortwave for any of the work we're doing here. This is because of some drifts in the radiometry of airs. The all sky is colder, the drifts are worse when it's colder. Uh, we hope to fix this, by the way. Um, and then here's a, a uh, 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 global surface temperature anomaly that we came up with. Again, this is what takes minutes to do. Uh, and of course, you see what Norm was talking about, kind of the hiatus and then real action starts here, which is of course an argument that we really need to keep this, uh, these measurements going. Um, so I'm, going to outline for people who aren't used to spectra a little bit about what we're seeing. This happens to be Chris. So now I'm just going to look at eight-year trends with SMPP Chris. And so what you see here in blue for these eight years is a very, very similar uh, plot. And it's easy. So what are you seeing here? You're seeing this is the mesosphere in this spectral region. This is the troposphere. So we see the green, the effect, CO2 greenhouse effect right in front of you. It's in, in plain view. This is a window region. So you see here surface temperature mostly. You see this bump right here, this bump right here are the CFCs. Their concentration is going down instead of up, although we can show that this one, I forget which one it is, is slowing down a little bit. Uh, Xiaoling Huang has done some work on that. Uh, ozone, so we can directly see changes in, in, in uh, uh, radiance due to ozone. Um, of course, remember this has got temperature included in it. And then here's the methane. So the blue is the data, and the red here is what happens when we subtract out the CO2 amount and the nitrous oxide uh, and the methane. 
And so you see stratospheric cooling. You see, as you go from stratosphere to the troposphere, you see the warming. The surface temperature is, is about two tenths of a, a K per decade for this eight year period. And then you see the methane. So you've got direct measurements of greenhouse gases. And the most interesting one really is right here. This is the water vapor band. And what you see here is, of course, the, the, the water vapor feedback surface, whoops, surface is up at 0.02, but you see almost nothing here due to water vapor um, uh, because of basically people will say the cancellation elapse rate with uh, water vapor uh, feedback. So, is what we're proposing, which I again feel strongly we have to do something simple or we're not going to be able to afford it, is uh, let's take a look at surface temperature trends using 1%, 3% to give me the data. This is our work, the OBC. This is AERS V7. This is climb caps, which is another version of, of AERS level 2. This version uses a neural net, AERS V7 as a first guess. Climb caps uses Mera 2 as an a priori. ERA 5, Mira 2, and then GIST temp is an acknowledged standard for atmosphere uh, for surface temperature. And what you see is you see very good agreement between UMBC, ERA 5, and GIST temp. Very, very good agreement. And actually, climb caps airs as, as well. This is not going to continue when we look at the atmospheric fields. I'll show you in a second. So here's airs V7, and it's got problems. Uh, and Mera, which I don't think is advertised as a to use this for it, but it's there, we looked at it, has, has got a number of problems. I don't think these two problems are connected with each other, but I, I'm not positive. Um, so, so 3% of the data gives you a very good surface temperature trends, and I have gone up to 10% of the data, hottest in each 16 day, three by five, and you get the same answer. Notice here that we correlate the best with climb caps airs because it's the same data set, and then we correlate the highest then with GIST temp, which is very nice to see, and the lowest with, with Mera 2. So now let's go to the harder part, and this is zonal temperature trends. Again, these are over, trends K per year over, over 19 years. And same listing here, except I've put in, instead of GIST temp, CMIP 6, just for kicks, the problem is CMIP 6 ends in 2014, so it's a different time period. Um, but the main thing that you see here is fairly good agreement between UMBC and ERA-5, except in the stratosphere, but then CLIMCAPS picks this up in the stratosphere. Mera 2 does not have it, but CLIMCAPS overall, except for that, has a very strong flavor of the trends of Mera 2, which is an a priori. And AERS V7 is kind of in between. We can use this to say, well, what part of this result came from uh, 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 the data and what part came from the a priori? Our a priori for airs is zero in all, in all cases except one next slide. So I think this shows that this, there are cheap, easy approaches that do well, and we are getting quite different strat than Mera 2. Water vapor is a different story. Uh, in some sense, and, 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 and the same in some sense. So this is a, a fraction per year trend in water vapor. So on the, on, basically you see AIRS V7 is, is pretty much uh, way out of, of, of uh, line with the other uh, measurements. And I, I should, you know, I have to say, you know, these products weren't designed for climate and they can't test it very easily until it's all long done. Climb caps looks much better, depends on what you call the truth now, of course. Uh, but what you can see here is to a large degree, climb caps and Mera 2 are very similar. Now, ERA 5 um, has a lot of similarity in the troposphere to Mera 2. Now, our result looks a little bit weird, and that's for good reason. We used a zero a priori. These sensors don't have high sensitivity to water vapor um, and from the upper upper trope to the strat. They just don't have it. Um, but you can see we pick up a lot of the same things, and I can't tell you yet whether this is true or not. But one interesting thing is that you do see 
this this kind of these cold, cooler features in the Arctic lower troposphere that do show up uh, in different varying degrees with the others. So I'm going to flip between two slides, this one we've been talking about and this one. So all we've done here is very quickly taken MLS. Now that's a 2006 to 2021 water vapor trend. So MLS is a limb sounder, microwave limb sounder, which can get the upper part of the atmosphere very nicely. And we have used it as our a priori here. So we can't resolve this dry uh, drying region because our kernel functions aren't, aren't allowed, just cannot do that. But you can see how it's an example how we can blend in. And I, and I want to say one thing, we turn this into global relative humidity and it's, you know, this is a arbitrary grid of uh, 100 atmospheric pressure layers and, and, and it's a little bit of a Mercator project projection, but um, relative humidity on average over the atmosphere is not changing, which is not a big surprise. So now I'm going to start talking about more OLR sort of examples. Um, this is a, something I want to make sure we saw. This is from Shai Ling Huang at University of Michigan, who most of he's more well known to the climate community than I uh, am by any means. Um, and he has has put together a a spectral OLR product that uh, uh, I think it has something like 20 wave numbers uh, uh, binned and done a lot of a lot of work with with this and continued into the airs regime throughout the airs regime. And uh, it allows you to help diagnose cancellations, for example, in OLR due to different spectral regions with different models. So I wanted to make sure that that was put up there. He's more better suited to talk about the details than I am. So Larry, this what can is we do? Two, two minutes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so what can we do with this, this um, data in terms of, let's say, feedbacks in OLR? What I'm showing here is feedbacks generated from this work uh, and CMIP-6 as an example, generated over this 2002 to 2021 timeframe. Uh, our results are generally pretty similar to ERA-5. You can't use MERA-2 for this due to the poor uh, surface T trends. Um, and this is just done by using the products we, we retrieve, temperature, water vapor, surface temperature, and so on, use them to calculate OLR changes, and then uh, you know do the feedbacks where these are the the, the model. You know, you take out the, the the forcings, and you can see that we get pretty pretty results that are reasonable. If you put um, in the in terms of the lapse rate, you can see that we're similar in the polar regions, but quite different. You expect a negative lap rate in 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 uh, the tropics and for this particular time period, you don't get it, ERA agrees with that. So we can also calculate total OLR since we're only using clear here, we can really only show clear OLR. And what you see here on the left in blue is the series all sky OLR. And then we plotted the UMBC clear OLR from this data set. And we see it's quite similar to series except in two regions right around here and here and those indeed are regions where there were changes in cloud now we don't agree as well with the series clear olr and as norm said that's a difficult product to produce and on the right we show one of the real values of this data set and that is the ability to to separate out the different components into olr so that you can see the forcings separately from 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 responses, and this this is something I think that should be extremely valuable uh, over the next uh, next several years. I won't talk about this much, but you can do statistical cloud fraction trends with this is done with two airs channels. You can look at the trends on the top left is ours, on the top right is MODIS, and they agree very 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 well at least over ocean. So there's a lot of different things you can do. And, the, and, and global averages are tiny, tiny amounts of, of, of lowering of clouds. Uh, another thing you can do with clouds is look at the time rate of change of the uh, cloud forcing on an individual footprint uh, uh, case. So you think, you assume you know the surface trend, you write, do the PDF of a, of a clear window channel, turn that into trends, 
And you see here in the same time period where we saw differences in, in clear and cloudy OLR, this increase in deep convective events and this kind of around 10 and this decrease in this range. This stuff is very, very easy to do. Uh, finally, this is just for kicks, but in about a week or two, I was able to derive measurement of large fires with airs by looking for outliers between the long wave and the short wave surface temperatures. Um, this is because the hot fire has got a big, big, big plonk uh, uh, contribution, so you can separate it from non-fire. And so in, uh, in two weeks, you can generate a, a long-term plot of this. You can take each one of these uh, events, there's about 6,000 events, and you can derive the fire temperature separate from the land temperature to some reasonable degree. And usually when I've done this, you get hot fires of 1,000 K or so, oh, that's fine, with areas of about 100 meters squared, uh, 200 meters squared, which I think also makes sense. These events agree very well with motors burn areas. So um, what I'm summarize here is that I think we have an extremely valuable data set to monitor climate change. And it's also, of course, very important for NWP weather prediction and reanalysis. Um, that's why the data set's gonna continue with Chris and with the ASI. AIRS was not an operational system, but it was effectively used operationally uh, at all the NWP centers. And it was a big success. So we've got a, 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 a they, they, they provide insights that I don't think you can get with the broadband inf observations. And we are starting to think and, you know, really work, uh, this work do with uh, Stephen Leroy, uh, to, to merge in different instruments for, for help. For example, GF, GPSRO should help uh, remove some of the null space errors in the, in the uh, tropopause area of the, of the airs retrievals. And uh, similarly, MLS could help with the uh, um, upper trope humidity. And the imagers could help us tremendously for analyzing time series of more cloudy data by helping us classify the scenes. Um, you know, we hope to continue this work, but we need two things. We need to keep the hyperspectral instruments alive uh, airs, airs could go on for a couple more years, and we need uh, uh, be able to reprocess and reprocess the Chris Level One B radiances. We at NASA, this is funded by the SNPP Program Office, University of Wisconsin and UMBC jointly produce the Chris Level One B radiances. We have improvements in there that NOAA doesn't do, such as Doppler effects, and we uh, reprocess quite often in order to, re to, to remove offsets, especially with the CHIRP uh, data set. Thank you. Thank you, Larry, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I think the, the best way to move forward now is actually to move to the discussion and Eric's presentation will be a component of the discussion. So at this stage, uh, I'll pass the baton to Graham. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, listen, um, I think what we'll do, we have a, we spent, might spend the first five minutes, Joel, addressing a few specific questions that have come up about a couple of the talks. So just clarification questions. So I think we'll dispense with those first uh, in the next five minutes. And then they're gonna kind of touch on there's kind of at least three broad themes that cross cut here. Um, one has to do with the entire message of this, this symposium, which Larrabee summed up really succinctly in a very nice statement. Level two, and I'll put at the instrument level two, plus time doesn't equal a climate data record. And there's a lot more, so much more that goes into it than that. And uh, Norm, for example, detailed pretty nicely as short as he could in the short time he had was that the, the the stewardship that's involved in maintaining a climate data record it's not just the instrument data record itself but it's the various sources of information that go into create a climate data record and the careful assessment that needs to be continually performed as you go along um i think another uh, overriding kind of theme and discussion uh, uh, was gaps how do you address gaps you know, obviously one way to address a gas, the philosophy of address a gap is, okay, let's make sure we don't have one. 
But I think that's probably a little bit unrealistic. I think we're likely to have in climate data records the emergence of gaps of one form or another across data, climate data records. So I think we'll come back and discuss the philosophy of addressing gaps. Uh, what might we be able to do to address a gap or maybe we just have to live with the issues um, uh, if we if if it's unavoidable. And then the third topic is that we should have sort of drawn out a little bit from Larrabee's talk, but it's going to lead, we're going to also sort of be highlighted with a short presentation by Eric, is sort of the next direct, next dimension maybe um, that's sort of becoming a reality, particularly with something like we've seen about to experience Clario Pathfinders in a few years, is the spectral dimension of Earth's energy balance. Uh, we saw from Larrabee's presentation how this spectral information really allows us to connect the radiation properties of the Earth to the variables and the properties that shape it. Um, so spectral contains very rich, rich degree of um, information, and it was fundamentally the the motivation for the the pre motivation to Clario, as expressed in sort of study by um, Richard Goody and so forth more than twenty years ago. So so these are three top topics, kind of a little bit more on the stewardship, a little bit more on the philosophy of trying to address gap, live with what can we do to to mitigate the effects of a gap should gap gap occur and um, then a little bit of discussion on the next kind of a, a next a, the next dimension which might be spectral as well as any other topics that the speakers want to kind of also further underscore but before we start there let's just go to real quick questions the first question was for you norm and it was from um it was from um uh, for Ralph Kahn, and it was basically had to do with your figure that you show. You don't think you have to pull it up, but your figure you showed where you had the um, um, Argo time series and the series time series, and they kind of mapped on each other, right? Except that there were some notable excursions on that mapping. You know, 2016 was highlighted, called out by Ralph, you know. So sort of a basic question is uh, it, this discrepancy between what you show in terms of uh, interannual variability versus Argo coming up, um, is there a lot? Is there something we can be learned? Is it real? Is there some physical part of the system that may explain this? Um, in short, um, um, Norm, you, what's your response? Yeah. Well, I asked this question to my co-author, uh, Greg Johnson, and he didn't have an immediate answer. Uh, but you, you do have to remember that Argo doesn't have complete sampling. It doesn't sample yeah, right. marginal Cs. And that year also um, was the 2015-2016 El Nino. Uh, was part of that, which redistributes heat in the ocean. So that combination may be part of the answer. Uh, I can't really say much more about uh, that. I don't know. Yeah. Um, um, Andy had a question about Argo bridging the gap. Should there be a gap? We'll come back to the gap discussion. I think that's uh, clearly with respect to EEI alone, but we'll come back to that. Um, um, Norm, Larrabee, there are a couple of questions with respect to your presentation. One is a very simple one. It was your, one of your very first view graphs. You had these spectra from the different hyperspectral instruments shown all in one diagram, and you had them offset from each other. The question was why there are differences in the brightness temperature, spectral brightness temperature between Yazzie, Chris, and Ayers. I think it's just you applied an offset that wasn't articulated. Oh yeah, there's a there's a DC offset, uh, but possibly they're wondering about the spectral part of it. I don't know. Oh, I think it was more just the offset. You know, oh, no, I just 20, offset twenty Kelvin off different yeah, between yeah, each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, that's all. Um, Mark Richardson asked, but I think you've already sort of touched on this, the use of radio occultation, you mentioned that right at the end, that would be a kind of a valuable tool to begin to assess, you know, the hyperspectral trends and particularly upper troposphere. Yeah, that's, so, that's exactly why uh, Stephen Leroy is part of my latest ROSES proposal or, or, or grant. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, okay, two, two more. We're just going to take two more and then we're going to get back to the main discussion. Um, why lapse rate fee? Um, yeah, for this is from Yoko. Why lapse rate feedback is positive from the observations in the tropics? That can, might be kind of a detail, but you showed up. Well, I, I, I can answer that with a non answer is you're asking the wrong guy. Okay. <laughs> and, and this is a similar one, I think. Uh, 
uh, from Sarah um, Larrabee. Can you please explain the wrong negative trends of airs v, uh, V7 off Antarctica? Well, I've I've talked to the Airs project about that a little bit, and I, I I think the the consensus is there were problems with B seven with the first guess in the Southern Oceans, and that's oh. the neural net. Yeah, so but I think it just sort of underscores, doesn't it, Larry? The broader picture is trying to assess these trends, and Norm 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 lives with this. Trying to assess these trends, you need to pull in all sorts of extraneous information to convince yourself it's real. You can't yep. just produce a trend and convince yourself because your instrument had performs and you think you know how the instrument performs, therefore it's real. It takes a hell of a lot more than that um, in terms of the stewardship to present this as a climate data record that you have confidence in. So I think this is one of the messages, you know, of this of, of this series is that the creation of a climate data record involves a lot more than just the instrument record alone. In order to produce this climate data record, one so, um, thing I would like to add there, Graham, is uncertainties. Yeah. We need these records to have, you know, documentation for how the data are produced, but we also need to to produce uncertainties with all of these records so that yeah, your users know how much they can rely on which data sets at which time. Right, and 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 that, in some ways, is critical. I would think towards developing any approach or any 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 yeah, any approach to addressing gaps if you don't right. have uncertainties attached to these you can't stitch things together you right. know when there's a gap in time so that's mm -hmm. just underscores the critical importance of uncertainties so what i thought i would do is um just to sort of underscore the spectral you know the value of spectral and the kind of maybe the thinking of spectral as the next next dimension that gets added that gets laid on top of these radiation budget radiation measurements, um, you know, and we have Clario Pathfinder, as I said, uh, on, soon on the horizon, which will give us solar spectral measurements reflected. I, I've asked Eric to present to us just expand a little bit on the emerging climate data record of spectral solar irradiance that's developing. Um, so, Eric, um, if you can share your screen, I've got about a 10 minute presentation, which okay. is sort of introduce this topic to the audience so that they know that this is also a related climate data record that's um so let's see can you see that screen yes i can eric thanks L let me let me present it and make sure that works about 10 minutes i'll give you about a about an eight minute in yeah hollow, hollow right okay is that the main full screen or are you seeing my presentation? i think like split screen like you know um uh, okay let me just yeah. work from this yeah okay so re really quickly thank you graham for um for inviting me and let me go through these uh fairly quickly just to highlight a little bit of uh, what greg was saying and establishing the long tsi data record i wanted to share some of the recent advances we've been making in solar spectral irradiance so taking each one of those data points that greg has shown and decomposing it into the spectrum so clearly, um, one of the issues that we have to deal with here is uh, a continuity, as, as was uh, discussed. And here's the ubiquitous plot that everybody's shown. From the incoming point of view, we, we want the spectrum because of the multifaceted processes that are going on in the atmosphere and trying to establish a longer term, what we would call climate quality record in the solar spectral irradiance uh, becomes important for that. Uh, all of the issues that Greg had mentioned with continuity and accuracy, we've made advances on since the source time period. And uh, just at the bottom down there, um, you know, as these climate models evolve, they're, they're, they're demanding more and more spectral information to, to really, uh, to really uh, advance uh, sort of how we can do the predictive nature as well as the elucidation of these processes. So from our schedule justification, as Greg mentioned, we're in the process of measuring the solar spectral radiance right now on TSIS-1, which is on the ISS. We have the follow-on mission that will launch uh, no sooner than August of 2024. So a continuity issue comes into effect there. So um, if you look at, let's see, the spectral part of, uh, of overlap, it, it's quite 
a different challenge than the TSI. TSI typically have many different instruments on many different satellites measuring the same thing. Spectrally, we have a two-dimensional problem, and the challenge is uh, reflected in not only temporal overlap, but spectral overlap. And then the challenges within that as far as accuracy, long-term stability, sampling, resolution. And this is a, an adapted figure from Alaria's paperback about a five or six years ago, just showing the trend over the last four decades in spectral radiance. And in 2003, we started covering the majority of the spectrum with source. And I should add that uh, up until source, many of these instruments, uh, the SSI was not their primary product. So we're beginning to get into a mode now where the primary product is SSI and we're trying to meet the challenges of, of doing those measurements. Here's the, the timeline going back about 20 years to the beginning of the source mission. Source with the TSI and SSI instruments lasted 17 years and it really stretched it out to try to overlap with TSIS. You can see there the TCTE uh, gap filler for TSI because of the glory launch failure. There was a very big concern that the TSI would have a gap. So uh, TSIS-1 began in 2018 and we continue as we are now. And TSIS-2 will follow on in August of 2024. And what I've highlighted in yellow are some areas that we've advanced recently to try to mitigate gap issues coming to the future. Just a highlight of TSIS-2 uh, that's coming up. We've just finished uh, spacecraft uh, CDR. Mission KDPC is next month, and the instruments right now have uh, ended final assembly, and we're in final calibration for, for those. So clearly, some of the issues that we have to worry about with this is uh, LASP is doing, has been doing these spectral measurements uh, almost continuously for four decades. The earlier missions, SME and URs primarily and ultraviolet. And beginning with source, we started to get into the visible and the near infrared and continuing that through. So some of the longer term challenges are beyond uh, the end of this decade, where are we going with spectral radiance? And we've uh, developed some new techniques and, and concepts uh, to evaluate that. But let me just highlight some of the new things that we're, we're advancing. So Greg has shown you know, the short-term variability as active regions moving across the disk, typically see a dip in the TSI or some enhancement either due to sunspot, uh, dips due to the sunspots or enhancements due to some vacular. So if we look at the spectral decomposition of that against what we know right now from a modeling point of view, which goes into our uh, long-term CDR, you can see to, from the ultraviolet through the near infrared here for this particular active region, we have very good agreement with what the model predicts. This is the spectral decomposition of, of what would be this uh, ratio of those two spectra. But there are regions where we do have quite a bit of difference from the model, so room for improvement. Uh, longer term, we're four years into the TSIS mission coming out of solar minimum and beginning solar cycle 25, and this is where we're at presently. Uh, this is plotted against what we would call the climate data record based on the NRL SSI2 SSI empirical model, and this is based on source reference, so we're hoping to validate things better. But you can see that over the last four years, as the onset of cycle 25 comes in, we're doing pretty well with agreement with the model. There are differences, and we're looking into that, but uh, we're advancing this pretty well. One thing that's necessary in these measurements, if we're doing our co uh, corrections for spectral pretty well, is that we have to integrate up to the TSI. Now, SIM, the instrument we have, measures about 96% of that TSI uh, from 200 nanometers out to 2.4 microns with one instrument. So if we take that, all of our spectra, integrate it up and compare it to the TSI, we get an offset of about 52 watts, which is the missing infrared portion. But more importantly, we get a measure of the trending against TSI. And you can see here, we have excellent trending in the integrated SIM measurement to about 0.06 watts. That's about 47 part per million of the TSI. And blowing that up, you can see we actually do track all of these features to less than 50 part per million. Here's a annual, uh, evaluation of our integrated SSI against the TSI measured simultaneously, showing the excellent results that we have. So as far as new missions and concepts, the 
you know, the last decadal basically warned of, uh, at the midterm review, uh, you know, strategies to try to mitigate gaps. So we became proactive in this to try to say, well, we can't rely really on uh, large missions and counting on overlap. So what can we do as either gap fillers or new measurement strategies? So this whole evolution now of the sort of a revolution in CubeSats got us thinking of uh, evolving technologies to do SSI a little differently. And this was our first concept mission to have a spectral irradiance monitor on a CubeSat. And we've done a lot of work. It offers uh, plentiful launch opportunities uh, if you can make them small enough. Now, the, the whole point is to try to be as accurate and stable as the, as the more uh, expensive missions, but we've advanced uh, new technologies working with our partners at NIST to try to improve both absolute accuracy and efficiency of detection in small detection volumes. This is a bolometer that we use using carbon nanotubes. And uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the things that has evolved from this is, so uh, I should uh, move this out here and show you that we were able to uh, compare on orbit the, the new um, uh, measurement techniques against, validate that against the actual uh, SIM measurement. So this is going into future directions to try to minimize gaps and improve things. Uh, we have this uh, under currently under development for a compact total radiance monitor that will fly soon. And all of these strategies then will try to demonstrate new mission concepts to, to as I said, either fly constellations of these measurements or, uh, or uh, opportunities to mitigate measurement gaps, as well as maybe pa uh, pave the pathway forward. So uh, I hope I gave a little taste there of the uh, spectral side of yeah, that. Yeah, thanks, Eric. That was fantastic. And you touched, began to touch on the latter few slides on towards um, issues or steps toward to mitigate, perhaps to mitigate gaps, um, i.e. if you can make the measurements small enough and affordable enough, it lends itself more, more, more to more implementation of these uh, measurements to, to readily, more readily fill a gap. Um, if the measurements, so uh, uh, continue to be, you know, large in cost, then it's you know, gaps, well, um, um, perhaps likely to occur uh, yeah. in sustaining these for decades. Um, so we have to kind of grapple with this issue. So anyway, so I think that um, I'd like to sort of throw it back to uh, Greg, Norm, and Larrabee uh, to just give us your thoughts on, on how are we going to address gaps gaps are likely to occur. What's the, what would be a strategy that we might sort of uh, develop our pre, uh, to sort of bolster, uh, bolster ourselves against the likelihood of impacts on gaps? One of them, like we alluded to, is the uncertainties. Knowing how accurately we're measuring something now versus how accurately we can measure it after a gap. So if we can make those uncertainties better by improving the absolute accuracy, we can withstand a gap better because we can tie just by accuracy um, discontinuous measurements together. Another one is some sort of proxy or model. Eric was showing some agreement between measurements and models. So if we have models that can, using some proxy, um, can tell us what the measure end we have is doing, we can fill a short-term gap, at least with that model. Models are pretty good for short-term variability. They're less good for long-term variability. Um, so short-term gaps we can perhaps this, handle with models too. Yeah, this works for your problem, right? Because where you have a model of the sun, is that what you're saying? You use well, no, it, it should even work for some of the Earth measurements. Norm was showing how imaging can help with the series instrument. Yeah, so right. if we had enough images, perhaps you could integrate and come up with some sort of estimate for even what the series results are. It, it's not ideal. You would like to have continual. Yeah, right measurements, but if you really had to, you could yeah. start to fill in short-term variability with models. Norm. Well, of course you could, you can do anything. It's what you give up in the process. And I think yep. that's the key, you yeah. know, it's all a signal to noise ra ratio type argument. 
you give up on your ability to do trends if you can't get it down to a tenth of a watt per square meter, right? Because well, you that, increase your uncertainties. You increase your uncertainties, which means you won't be able to do trends. You won't be able to say decade to decade how things really changed because you're the magnitude of the change is going to be much smaller than your ability to detect it. So you give that up. But on the other hand, you can, you know, the, yeah. the process you use to fill a gap will enable you to maybe look at ENSO uh, because that's a much bigger signal. So you give something up, um, you yeah. can do it, but you give something up as a cost to everything. So a bigger question in my mind that we're, 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 we're sort of defeatist here we're saying, well, yeah, we're going to have a gap no matter what. We need to make things really cheap to avoid a gap. Well, those are those are values sort of uh, questions. What do we value? Do we value the the climate data record? Do, you know, and if we do, then we'll do something to avoid it. And up until now, I think it, it, we've been doing it kind of on the side. We, we sort of see it's important, but we're putting a lot more yeah. money elsewhere. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, but, it, those are things that, that aren't really necessarily what scientists discuss in these types of workshops, but, you know, it's the elephant in the room in my mind. Well, you know, Michael Garay's got a comment here, just a really right on this, actually. Uh, you know, well, you know this, this, this series of symposia is really more or less sort of laying out the landscape of kind of what what do we have that's out there in terms of CDRs? When what's it take to maintain them? And what we find, of course, is that what it takes to maintain them is quite a large amount of stewardship that requires support, obviously. It's not just the instrument itself. Um, it's not just level two plus time equals climate, as um, Larrabee said. Um, you know, climate data records, uh, as Michael said in his comment here, is they're not kind of sexy. They're still sustained. They're long. They require a sustained effort, long term. Um, you know, they're not necessarily splashy, unless you get twenty years of data record and you also all of a sudden find a discover a new aspect of a trend. Then it gets splashy, but you have to wait twenty years. So um, it it is a challenge to maintain these climate data records, as you well know, you folks, because you folks are doing it and maintaining the support to to continue to develop and maintain and test and all of the stewardship of these data records. Um, it's, it's quite a challenge. Um, but that's sort of in the background, what we want to kind of do for this particular symposium is to kind of highlight what we have and what it's taken to do it and what the challenges are. Um, and then we'll kind of move on to later on down the symposium series um, more topics that to hopefully will discuss these challenges in more depth. So this is Joao, and I would like to strengthen two things that uh, very quickly that Norman mentioned. Uh, one is the value that we give to things, right? I mean, when we're talking about doing things more economically, uh, that's very valuable. But if you look at the, ex the successful example of satellite data for numerical weather prediction, there is a huge amount of money being spent on that. And the reason is because there is a clear connection between the amount of dollars or euros that are spent on building the new LEO and GEO missions yeah. and the impact that it will have at the societal level. So, so that sort of aspect, that sort of traceability uh, path there is very well quantified in my prediction. There is no reason for that not to be the case in terms of climate prediction, I think we have the tools and many people have tried to do this. So yeah. if weather prediction can do this, why couldn't uh, climate monitoring do this? The second one is very quickly, uh, Norman stressed the fact that even very basic things, things that are not particularly you know, exciting, like keeping missions alive can make a huge difference. The, the slide, if I can remember that you showed Norman, shows that the probability of a gap for series, if, series in aqua, Terra and SNPP are allowed to exist until technically uh, it's not feasible, then the probability of a gap in the next three or four years is very, very small. Otherwise, it goes to 30% very quickly. So those very, as Mike Garay was talking about, things that are not particularly exciting actually play a key role. Um, Wingsy, can you make sure everyone's unmuted now? Because I, I think that the audience can just chime in now and raise points, discuss. 
um, rather than me trans translating it. Um, so folks in the audience, if you want to chime in. I, 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 yeah, prior yeah. wanted to add in a little comment too on one approach where we actually did um, help with a gap was after we lost the glory mission the only way we got an instrument up real quickly was we had one sitting on the shelf from the source era having built a couple of instruments during source 15 years prior and when well, one of them was purely a lab instrument but when glory didn't launch properly we were imminently looking at a gap and nasa was real quick to provide funding let us bypass some normal routine procedures and get something launched that we could pull off the shelf, calibrate and fly very quickly. Right. So having spare instruments is also one way of mitigating a upcoming gap. So um, what, I, what I would ask you, put your hand up, I think folks, you know how to put your hand up electronically and we'll um, ha have you fire away questions and comments. I think Tom Vonderha, were you? I yeah, I was trying you. to. I was trying to say something. Uh, I think for the gaps, it's time to think about the era of uh, constellations of small sats making the measurements uh, uh, for Earth, and 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 they'll all be intercalibrated by something like uh, Clario or GPM. So I think we're thinking of old gaps, but new gaps. We're not going to lose all those satellites at the same time. So um, I think I think we've we've got to look ahead a bit here. Yeah, Tom, this is Eric. That was uh, sort of the feeling behind uh, the evolution of the SSI, the compact monitors that we could fly constellations. And we're getting to the point now where the instrument technology is uh, is really improving and the calibration techniques. So it's something that's certainly on our on our yeah. list. Yeah. I make a comment about that. I think I think it's wonderful, but the danger is if we get too carried away with new concepts, if, you know, and we don't keep the sort of status quo going. There's a danger of um, having a gap because the new yeah. you know, new concepts usually don't work the first time. So you kind of have to keep steady pace, the the steady process, the steady approach you're using, and at the same time test out these new approaches, make sure they're mature and reliable before you give up the old ways. And I don't yeah. think we're there. I think the, the constellation stuff is great, but I, I don't know how reliable I, I wouldn't, you know, bet my life on that at this point. <laughs> I, I'd like to second what Norm just said. This is Larrabee. Uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people don't realize the extreme amount of care that goes into these uh, constellation instruments. And and there are many 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 things that could go wrong with uh, CubeSat type hyperspectral, uh, and believe me, I believe Noah uh, really wants to go that way. And uh, what could happen is by the time you've characterized a CubeSat, uh, uh, NWP is going on to something else. It's, it takes NWP a long long time to spin up the assimilation of a weather sensor. Yeah. I, I think the message is one size doesn't fit all. You know, small sat constellations will will address certain kinds of monitoring needs, but not all. Right? And so like, right. We well, just got to we just got to be thoughtful about this. Well, I agree with that. Hank, uh, I, I just like to agree with what Larrabee had to say, both more recently and also about the huge value of the spectral. Instruments, yeah. instruments that we already have. Yeah, yeah, right. And I guess we've mentioned Clario only briefly, but I think as far as something that can leverage what we've already invested in, we have these infrared sounders and Larrabee shown the value. If we can put an absolute reference up that's referenced on orbit of a Clario type, then we've put a, a nail in the record for any future problems with gaps. And I think it's inexpensive. It's just leveraging something we've already spent a lot of, of resources on. Right. So the Clario IR, I think, is extremely important for us to add to the Clario 
uh, shortwave. So, so part of a, a, a potential strategy for gap filling for certain certain class group of measurements for the neural system would be a kind of a calibration system in space, right? That's what you're kind of hitting at, Hank, right? Yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's what cross I'm talking about. You're allowed to cross-reference all kinds of different measurements um, and hence that's, provide an anchor point. Yeah, I mean, it, I think everybody knows this, but basically it's to bring the absolute standards into orbit. So we're not calibrating and then 10 years later relying on that or 20 years later. Yeah. And, and of course, it's been mentioned by several people that this is certainly one good way to deal with gaps. Yes, it's possibly, but it hasn't been proven for a wide variety of variables. So I, again, I caution excitement about a new concept prematurely. I think it has, yeah. been, but it hasn't been shown. So, um, and I think the we should- The thing I, I point out about this with, in that regard, is that the fundamental principles of in the infrared are really demonstrated by the instruments we have in the orbit. And what you can do is with a, the one you put in orbit is simplify uh, the instrument enough that you eliminate some of the major sources of error. So the fundamental concepts are proven. We know about polarization effects, nonlinearity effects. Yeah. And if we can eliminate them on a simple instrument put up there specifically for this, it's uh, in some sense been proven. Without getting into the details of the IR instrument, though, the bigger concept is improvements in absolute accuracy or how you get around a data gap. Yeah. Fundamentally, yeah. Yep. Yep. And how, yeah, exactly how you do that. And what you mean, uh, different measurements, there might be slightly different approaches for different kind of measurement suites. You know, the IR might be one, you'll have a different approach than maybe monitoring the sun. Right, but but the idea is the same: improvements yeah, yeah, in yeah, accuracy. The, the principle around, is the same. And the other differences between the weather monitoring and the climate monitoring. Climate monitoring is a long, long time period, where it's going to be harder to get a long record without gaps. So you right. need the absolute accuracy more for climate than you do for weather. I think it's our insurance policy against gaps. Mm -hmm. and, you know, everybody knows about there was a conference on SI traceable uh, climate observing systems in 2019 and the report was just put out at, at the uh, beginning of this year. Bruce Wyalicki and many others and Greg are involved and I think that's a good reference for what uh, people are suggesting that we proceed with. Right. Yeah, we do emphasize in their SITSAT, the SI traceable satellites uh, that can cross calibrate other instruments that are on orbit and they also provide very good absolute accuracy measurements themselves. So, so uh, in some uh, sense, uh, everything, some, uh, you, everything you put up there is SI traceable, but what this really means is you're putting it up there with a reference that right. itself is SI traceable. So it's distinctly different from what we've been doing for decades. And I was just going to ask um, um, Hank, but I think Dave Tobin's already done it. I was just going to ask for sticking the link on that report onto the chat, but I think he's done that, right? Um, Calvalportal.coss.org. Yeah, that, that is the one. one. Thank you, okay. Dave. Thanks, um, Dave, yeah. Um, so anyone wants that, can get access to that. That would be great. I just want to make one point about, about spectral measurements. It's, it's spectral measurements offer enormous value beyond calibration, CalVal. I think people think of Clario as like a CalVal. There's, I think there's an enormous value in terms of the insight it tells us about the Earth system itself, the spectral information it tells us, enormous insight about the Earth system itself. And I Absolutely. think we've got, and we got that, and I think Larrabee showed that. Yeah, Larrabee's talk, I think, called that out well. Um, so I just want to make that point that because um, I know some part of the community just think of the spectral part um, as maybe just serving as a calibration, a calibration of, of multiple instruments of different spectral responses and so on. It's, it's much more yeah, a combination of information content that's hugely greater and absolute accuracy. Okay. Um, any other comments? Open up. 
to comments. I just want to get make sure I get this report that Dave Tobin has highlighted. I guess, um, Graham, the, in the reflected solar, it, I think the role is probably more calibration than in the infrared, where you might be able to take two measurements separated four years, 40 years apart and make some sense of how climate change. Uh, I do that in reflected solar. Yeah, but I think the spectrum of reflected solar has an enormous amount of information about the Earth system as well. It's enormous. Yeah. Like I, I mean, it's rich. Internal variability is going to bite you there, though. I think uh, it's much, you know, it's the separating what's dry. I don't know. I, mean, I, I, I wouldn't downplay the importance of spectral solar as well. I mean, you mean look, the entire, entire, you know, ecosystem community uh, lives and dies with the spectral solar. Um, no, 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 I'm not so, I'm talking about. I'm talking about reflected solar, Clario. That's what I'm talking about, reflected solar, spectral reflected solar. Uh, uh, all I, sorts of information about the ecosystem, about the atmosphere. Obviously, it's aerosol and clouds. I, I yeah, I, I, I don't buy it that it's just a calibration device at all. Anyway, that's my view, though. Yeah, it, uh, but I don't, I haven't seen anybody really simulate how you can, you could maybe say something about aerosols. Uh, because we don't have, we don't have, we, we have hyperspectral IR measurements. We've had some, that for some time. Uh, I haven't seen a study that shows even with simulated data, how you can unscramble the difference right. between two spectra separated many years apart and say something about what drove those changes. Right. That's tricky. Land, whether it's a surface, whether it's yeah. particles, whether it's clouds, yeah. um, getting a clean separation like you can much easier yeah. in the infrared. Yeah. So that's that's where I'm coming from. That may be the wrong use of it, trying to interrogate trends. You want to look at um, other parts of the Earth system from right. respect to solar. But anyway, any other comments, folks? The floor is all yours. Graham, I had a comment in the chat. Is that is that Ralph? Yep. Um, hang it. on, Ralph. I'm looking at participants. So let me get back to the chat because um, 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 um. just fire it off, Ralph. Rather than me, um, are you you'd be talking about budget saving efforts. You mean? Why don't you right. just yeah. go without? It? Yeah, Ralph, it was just talk. that. So coming up with uh, budget saving efforts is, of course, the responsible thing to do. However, Norm pointed out just a few minutes ago that uh, with what amount to capped resources every decision is still a trade-off. And given yeah. the societal importance of not only the solar and infrared radiation budget, but also some of these other things we were just discussing, like uh, cloud processes and yeah. aerosol forcing, is yeah, yeah. there any way for us to push back more effectively on increasing the budget, especially given the minuscule budget these efforts is actually given overall compared to other NASA and, and government expenses? And I'm just wondering because you know we always are struggling to fight amongst ourselves to get a little piece yeah. of a small budget to begin with, and the, I, I think the real question has to go up to higher levels. Yeah, sure, sure. And I'm wondering how that should happen. I mean, and it's a question as much for you, Graham, as as for anybody else here. Since Can I just make one in this. quick comment. This is Hank. You know, Bruce Wylicki, we're working with Cook, and I think Cook was the major economic guy, did quite a bit of work on this, and there's several papers out there on assessing the value to climate of these types of new measurements. Yes, I, I know that worked very well, and, and absolutely, that's part of making the case. And I think the speakers today made the case, too. And yeah. we've made the case in other papers regarding aerosols, for example. I mean, the case has been made many times. But somehow it never seems to be effective, and we're always pushed back into fighting amongst ourselves for a very, very limited resource. Yeah, yeah I think you've made a very good point. We've got to figure out a way to be heard, and and not assume that it's always a uh, fixed budget. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what the next decadal survey is likely to hold, but um, in the part previous decadal survey that I. I participated on um, 
um, continuity climate data records that that was kind of that I would argue that ball was punted that was that was punted away because it's a, it's a complicated issue that we didn't have the bandwidth for at that decadal survey it may come up in this next decadal survey or we as a community ought to call it out we'll I, I presume we're going to have an opportunity as a community to express our hear our, have our voice heard about what we feel ought to be in the next decadal survey maybe maybe climate data records or support of you know continuity measurements that maybe that needs to be brought more to the fore at least from a nasa perspective that's only a nasa perspective of course um but but graham again you're picking out pieces of it and saying well this should be highlighted or that should be highlighted and i think the real question is shouldn't a number of things all be highlighted and rather than making it again a trade-off amongst the things yeah, we're but there has to be we're trying to avoid you know we this this symposium is not not setting priorities trying to set priorities i think that's got to ha happen at some point at some point priorities are going to have to be set as the what needs to be monitored because you can't monitor everything about the other system it can't be done we can't we just don't have a there's not enough there's not enough currency in the world to do that so we have to have a prioritized set of things that have been monitored and what should they be that 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 question has never been answered to be honest with you um it's done in an ad hoc way um it's done in a way that all you do the what we monitor and what has priority is what we've done in the past has the priority of what we do in the future that's not necessarily what we actually need to monitor for the earth system so those some hard questions need to be asked are, are asked and answered um I don't know that that's necessarily that's not the purpose of this sort of symposia, but it is to raise, begin to raise these questions at some point down the road. You know, you're asking me to solve a problem that might not be solvable. Um, no, no, no. I, I, I think I mean I agree with what you just said about having to set priorities, but I would say that the list of things we can afford is only like the first couple of things in any priority list we might make rather than the first, say, half a dozen, which might be really re the responsible way to go. Yeah. Um, yeah John, I'm just trying to read the chat a little bit, okay. I think Graham, while you're reading, um, you know, in, 19, in the 1980s, we had a National Climate Program Act of Congress, passed by Congress, and it wasn't perfect. And it left that responsibility of uh, agency, you know, which agency takes the lead between NASA and NOAA. But that act could be amended to get what Ralph and others want, to get a single agency given the responsibility and the budget to do climate long-term climate monitoring and you know it was done in the 80s and, and it could be done again and once you have an act it's easier for them to amend it than to start a whole new one yeah. so you know i think we should call out the need to uh, update the national climate program act yeah, and I do want to give a good shout out to NASA for doing so themselves, for taking it on themselves to have developed instruments to get good measurements. There was a point a lot of those operational things were transferred to NOAA and didn't succeed in going forward, and NASA responsibly took them back and kept those records going. Uh, NASA has also been very quick at filling in gaps where we've had potential gaps coming up. So I really do want to compliment NASA for being willing to take these records on, even if they're not officially their responsibility. Yeah, what we plan to do with this, well, I don't know what the ultimate outcome of these symposium will be, but probably some sort of report, maybe a BAMS article or something, I don't know. Um, but we want to highlight the real importance of this monitoring from of Earth from space. Mm -hmm. and there needs to be a coherent strategy for this. Um, this has been this is a message that's not new. It's been called out. It's been called out by the folks who were remember, heavily involved in Clario, for example. Um, but you know, um, that's probably all we can do in this context, Ralph. 
Um, well, so, maybe we should have this discussion in another forum. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think so. I think this would be kind of the... I, I'd welcome that, but I think yeah, yeah. it needs to be had because I don't think we're really getting the full value out of what we need to be doing. And you, yeah. So, so the this forum here is identifying the scientific needs and the importance of these measurements, but then perhaps there's another mini symposium that focuses on how do we implement. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, I mean, and it's not just the budget, the radiation budgets, it's also aerosol forcing. It's also, well, we, yeah, but, well, yeah. We're, we're, we're not done with the mini symposia yet, Ralph. Yeah, we're not done. This is just the start, Ralph. There's going to be oceans, there's going to be ecosystems, carbon. Well, uh, I, I mean, again, I agree topics. with prioritizing, but but I would say that there there is at least half a dozen things that are are valuable, important enough that they should be accepted and and they should be addressed. Yeah, well, that's so, prioritization, Ralph. Well, so uh, okay, so I don't want to interrupt you guys, but I think that there's people. At least I think that there's one uh, person, Stacy Stacy Bolin has her hand up. So uh, okay. maybe we should just thank you. Go to yeah. Just make Thank sure that God. everybody who wants to say something is allowed to say. The, yeah. the one last thing is that we are already 16 minutes over. I, I, I think many of us are happy to stay over, but everybody else, you know, feel, please feel yeah. free to leave. Thanks. But Stacey, why don't you go ahead? Or just while we're still airing out the scope of the challenges involved, you know, yeah. even if uh, additional resources are found, even if policy things clear the way, there are other resources in play here, include things like the community that's able to actually do the work and where attention actually gets focused. And so um, being mindful of both intended and unintended consequences, you know, trying to think in terms of both tactical and strategic is something that's going to require, I think, a lot of patience from all of the different communities involved. Because while there's a certain visceral tactical need desire, depending on where you stand on any given measurement for continuity, then you also, is it the best long-term view to try to have a system that can both maintain knowledge and advance, have some sense of um, internal tension to improve itself and be self-reflective about what's the right thing to do to actually steward the ability to have an entire system. So while there's always a shortage of funds, and I, I agree there's a shortage of funds for what it's worth, but I'm not trying to minimize that. I think there's always going to be the need to envision and try to make trades at some level that span across multiple communities, but for each community that's involved to help feed into a process to minimize the negatives associated with that, we'll need to better understand how these different paths to a longer term system, what are the pluses and minuses of them? And as an example, I heard brought up, you know, small sets will have a constellation of them that'll keep continuity when you read it as having a, a thing dedicated to take a measurement there at any given time. But that might actually increase the burden on the community or the cost associated with the community trying to steward that record by trying to piece together things that are um, more disparate from each other or are lower overall accuracy or uh, pick your quality metric um, to actually merge them into something coherent. And so the question then becomes, well, what do you do if, if the long-term approach involves some of these more risky or different approaches, what do you need to invest in to enable that or to evaluate that or to inform it? And so I think not just in terms of the measurements themselves, but the program of how the community evolves and needs support is something that we need to think about too, to help um, move towards a different or more, um, more holistic future state where we have both continuity and advance across multiple important data records. Thanks, um, Stacey. Um, any other comments? Hands, right, I'm back on the participant list now. I can see hands raised. Any other comments from anyone? 
we can call this the end of the the end of this form of the symposium and we'll be in touch with you all as the next as the next symposium that we plan to hold in a number of weeks time thanks for kicking it off Graham thanks guys um Joao do you want to make any final comments so just I would like to, first of all to thank just thanks to all the speakers and the participants yeah, and absolutely. we will keep this up fantastic keep this up thank you thanks all thanks to Wing Z for setting this all up thanks so much Wing Z yeah Wing Z thank you and um um, can we document the chat? Uh, Wingsy, keep that doc documented somewhere. Uh, yes, I'll I'll keep it. Okay, I'll thanks. Document. Yeah. Thanks. Right, thank you. Excellent. Thanks, all guys. Thanks, all.